It was in the summer of three years ago that we buried my father. Thirty years and a week older than me to the day. A pretty exact marker of expectancy. I was also spending a lot of time with the boy, then aged three, which could be unsettling because my own memory reached back to his age. So situations we found ourselves in, and the way he reacted, as I once might have done, turned into ambushes on the past. And even now I find myself pitched back, helpless. I measure life at both ends now, marking the boy's height on the back of the door, thinking about my father, and thinking about a stupid argument I had with the boy's mother about being ten minutes late, which wasn't really about lateness, but about time itself, about what ten minutes means to someone aged three, and to someone accelerating into those years you never imagined yourself in. And it was about my father, and his religious belief and my lack of it, and how nobody is standing now between death and me. You are my best friend. What are you looking for? Hard to believe. I found you temporarily insane. These days I've taken to driving all the time, never stopping, carried along not by the constant motion and linear unfolding of the road, but by driving's dreamlike state of mind. Which takes me back to haunt old haunts, and that elevated three-mile expressway which stands as a rare example of the modern city London never became.
built when concrete was king. The flyover shows its age these days. And as with age, it both slows down and speeds up at the same time. It becomes more about the past. It becomes a symbol of lost opportunities. It becomes a memory bank of other journeys. I've also become an assiduous collector in the full understanding that such activity is mildly pathological. But not seeing at first how these old images represent a growing acceptance of the insignificance of things. How they're tangible in a way electronic communication is not. With a faded old photograph of men in uniform capable of acting as both a reminder of death and a talisman against it. My contact nowadays is limited almost entirely to the virtual. Face to face, a thing of the past. Emails, internet, logging, drift. And were you to ask what hasn't changed, I would say we still have ugly three pin plugs and too much wiring. TVs got flatter and so did everything else in this ironed out electronic world. And I'm fascinated by the withdrawal on offer into a mirrorless space, outside time zones, where people can create alternative lives ruled by unseen correspondence. So, an actor in the dark, bunkered in Berlin, playing an habitual emailer of unknown women, reporting back from the outer reaches of cyberspace, like some 19th century explorer lost in the jungle. Theory, text, virtual seduction. I may be 47, 67, 87 on the outside, but inside I'm still 22, dreaming of girls from 25 years ago. You may be housebound, broke, and overweight and stuck in a deathless marriage, surrounded by kids, but in your text you get that rush you haven't had for years. Someone gets you. You suddenly have depth again, maybe even for the first time. But what are you doing there to begin with? Who is real me? Who is the occult, occluded, open sesame me? It's hard to avoid how much everything has flattened out with globalization, instant access and the overloaded image bank. So much of life now experienced second hand. But for all the excitement of the internet, for which read online gambling, conspiracy theories and internet porn, most of it remains as flat as the plains of the American West, blighted by tumbleweed 
and inhabited by the redundant, the forlorn, and the unvisited in search of belonging. Just once, for one day in my life, I would like to feel that I and everyone speaking to me were talking total sense. I would like to be able to talk freely. I want a life unconditioned by resentment, not always on the verge of aggression. I would like to fall in love before it's too late. Don't care who with. I would like a feeling of assignation to life, not sitting here calculating how many fucks I've got left. The middle ground is hardly there anymore. I Google, therefore I am. You YouTube, therefore you are. Representing a big shift away from thought and being thought of to the necessity of being seen and needing to be seen. But here's a paradox. Our world appears to be the opposite of Gothic, yet the 20th century, which was once described as one of disappearances, makes most sense if read as Gothic, given its primary impulses of panic and fear and atmosphere of mystery and horror. Therefore the gap between the romanticism of the paintings of Caspar David Friedrich and the theatrical clamor of the Frankfurt Stock Exchange may not be as great as supposed. It isn't the more modern, streamlined theorists who are strangely silent on the subject, but the older, slimmer, more reposed and almost forgotten Gaston Bachelard that we must return to for any consideration of what email might be. A new poetic of space, a new way of looking to the flames. It also combines Walter Benjamin's favorite figures, the angel and the detective. The fantasy of finding that long lost lover, like all of a sudden your Interpol, all the resources of Interpol for a whim, not to find a murderer or thief, but to find that special one who might steal from you exactly what you want stolen. The movie camera and the car came of age in the 20th century. And if you put the two together, you had a perfect fusion for a while. A projection, a hymn to the virtues of the extended shot, suspended space, stillness and motion, false security, that now seems less about the road ahead than the approach of the speeding car in the rear view mirror. A flight from the past. Though the question, what are you driving from, whose answer is perfectly obvious, remains unasked in the panic of all those disembodied voices on the radio. We all find ways of losing ourselves. constant position of saying no, which I rather enjoyed, but I don't remember feeling depressed. Looking back, that whole stupid business of his birthday party was a sign of how wrong things were. Then he announced afterwards that he had been depressed most of that time. So what do I know? She came very hard and quickly, and I remember thinking, this has nothing to do with me. Anyway, a state of non-depression still has its roots in depression. Depression amounts to a life governed by a mismatch of acquiescence and control, resulting in going along with things than deciding one doesn't want to.
In the still blank night of half dreaming, we type and wait and read and reread, staring into the screen in which desire hallucinates a perfect response to every framed inquiry. Anticipation is everything. To my surprise, I find myself driving through the bleak flatlands of late middle age a landscape none of us gave any thought to, and suddenly bang, you're in it. Not anywhere you expected to find yourself, let alone with a small boy in tow, and the fire and airbenders of Avatar, and pursued by the dark forces of Pokemon. Darkray, Pokemon 491, he tells me, can lull people to sleep and force them to dream while Miss Magius, Pokemon 429, produces cries that sound like incantations, and those hearing it are tormented by headaches and hallucinations. Instead of shooting up or jerking off, you send the desire into space and your breathless pleasure comes from awaiting its return, subtly altered, contaminated by its passage through the domain of the other, anonymous but intimate. Maybe it's no coincidence that so much email correspondence is written before bedtime or after getting up. A dream time assignation. The metaphysical equivalent of sex messed hair. A dead giveaway. Stalked by memories in the rearview mirror, we drive on. Beyond the land of the souvenir postcard, towards landscapes which resist the trivialization of themed Britain. On the road, we outrun Drapion, Pokemon number 452, whose clawed arms have the power to make scrap of a car. So much information, you can't store everything. You'd go mad if you didn't instantly delete it. Erase, delete, forget. Remembering blankly, not detail, but number. How many years, how many women, how many drug nights. A specific logic of forgetting. This needs to be investigated. Uh, or forgotten. All previous important decisions were made in response to someone else and what they wanted. The first cries of ages, what do I want and how much time is there to work that out? The boy can't imagine a world without an internet and is disbelieving when I say it isn't much older than he is. He tells me Pokemon is short for pocket monsters and points to the big sheds which are part of their world.
Sure enough, Pokemon 292, Shed Ninja, turns out to be one of the sheds. Sheds being souls housed in cast off shells which neither move nor breathe, but looking into the hole in its back can suck out a person's soul. True, anything could be going on in the box diseased turkeys, supermarket stock, pit bull fights, experiments in genetic mutation, or the transportation of lost souls. These prosaic sheds are the first buildings of a new age, the apotheosis of non-place, those locations of transit where we now spend so much of our lives. They render architecture redundant by their anonymity. They leave everything to the imagination. They first emerged in response to new distribution patterns, followed by the second wave of retail parks and giant supermarkets. Then Ikea, that windowless box and cathedral to the new religion of flat backing. It was the start of the boxing of society. Now, of course, we're always being encouraged to think outside the box, which translates as don't you dare. The screen never asks. Who do you think you are talking to here? But it takes a lot of effort to keep this anonymous sublime object in the air. You log on as if for some manual factory job. Rather than being carried adrift, it's more like an intensely pleasurable bailing out to stay afloat. Wanting, but dreading, and enjoying because dreading. Every reply of this angelic conversation. Work and leisure were easy to define when I was growing up with industries and unions, old-fashioned high streets and factory plants. These sheds reflect the shift from an industrial economy to a consumer one, to semi-invisible service industries and computers, screened by surveillance and high security. Privatization makes public buildings more withdrawn and harder to read, plus the addition of identity passes, access codes and uniformed guards turns business life into something akin to a state of military alert. Childhood upheavals of an army brat help explain my obsession with this new quasi-military landscape. These blind buildings, with nothing to say what they are, have their roots in the Second World War and technocratic revolutions dating from then.
Dem Straßenverlauf sechs Kilometer folgen. Moving into the domain of Dusk Noir, Card 477, we enter the realm of Per Ugly, which invades other Pokémon nests. We drive to Poland in pursuit of evidence of one of the strangest footnotes of the Second World War. For in 1941, after the Nazis had occupied Poland, a plan, hardly conceivable in the context, was drawn up to modernize the old town of Auschwitz and make it into the equivalent of a yuppie new town for the bright young pioneers of the expanded Reich. A civilian architect was employed on site to execute drawings. His plans included 12 schools, six kindergartens and 20 playing fields, and the removal of the Jewish cemetery to make way for a Nazi party building with a hotel, cinema and restaurant. His New Year card for 1942 offered greetings from the birthplace of a new German town. By 1945, his project remained almost unrealized beyond his models and drawings, apart from a couple of buildings in the town square. And after the war, he returned safe home to a distinguished career. Bleak morning, unusual, unusual, unusual. After this cigarette you stop. An indirect link exists between the architect and where I now live in the city of London, in an estate built on a wartime bombsite. I was struck by how, in a neat act of recycling that smacked of heavy irony, the rubble from London's bomb damage was shipped in 1941 and 2 to the east of England to form the core of the runways built for the bomber fleets that would return the complement by destroying so many German cities. What had started as a very approximate exercise had by 1945 become a precise technical skill in which the bomb became the means rather than the end, which was to create the firestorms that engulfed Hamburg and Dresden. This air war would also result in the peacetime employment of Dr. Hans Stosberg, architect of the new town of Auschwitz, who spent his post-war years reconstructing Hanover after Allied bombers had done their best to flatten it.
The boy's two favorite Pokemon cards are 483 and 484, Palkia and Dialga, who possess the ability to control space and time. drive into a new time zone, the future past, where everything is brighter and smaller, into the domain of Dusk Noir, card 477, who receives messages from the spirits and at whose command removes people to their world. Once new towns were visions of some kind of future, but not anymore. Now we're reversing into a tomorrow based on a non-existent past with built-in redundancy. keep quiet about the suicides. A recent public survey was keen to emphasize the quality of life on offer. But at an academic conference on urban landscape, a man came up to me and muttered that the suicides are much higher than average. It could be argued that these come with the territory because the region was first to convert to natural gas in an effort to reduce the number of people killing themselves by sticking their heads in the oven. You don't need a degree in sociology to work out what's wrong with the place. No sense of belonging, insufficient infrastructure, and lack of integration, leading to alienation, stress, and suicide. Perhaps what links these regressive new towns to the myopia of Stosberg's plans for the town of Auschwitz was the intervening failure of modernism, plus the fact that both towns were founded on a flawed premise. But now this little joy to know I'm further off to know I'm further off from heaven than when I was a boy than when I was a boy I was a boy When I was a boy, age seven, we lived in Germany as part of the British Army of Occupation of the Rhine. It was 1957, the time of the Cold War and the atom bomb. to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb, duck and cover.
Not until many years later, reading an American historian, did I understand exactly what I was a product of. A generation of children which had learned to process the horrific images of the Holocaust and the atom bomb through continual exposure to recurrent images of imminent death in popular culture. This and changing conditions, including consumerism, a new affluence and social permissiveness, combined to form a prescription for a deep ambivalence about life and the future. Gathering thoughts from every corner of this electronic planet. is the bomb contributed an urgency to the prevailing protest cultures. Let's fuck now before it's too late. But with the polymorphous threat of terrorism, the idea that we might be torn apart on the train or bus to work, or at the airport on the way to our one holiday this year, we've entered a solid mode of forgetting. It's all forgotten before we leave the house. A bomb goes off, it's forgotten by the time the news is over. It's more than Freudian denial, this forgetting. More blank, overt, sexy. Sexy as opposed to erotic. Blank as opposed to complex. Overt as opposed to deep. It is a crisis about what one has and does not have, and feeling comfortable with oneself and who one is, and what one has done, and what is left, and how one treats people one is with, and how in that there is space for privacy and intimacy, and a solid core, which I still believe is possible. For the bomber martyr, the virgins wait in paradise. As if paradise were a MySpace page you could log on to. Just press the button and explode. Not so different from internet porn. Except that the bomber's lover is other, beyond, sky wide. Where in the West we repeat and reference and refer endlessly, even in sex. Maybe the exploding body of the terrorist is the new erotic object of secret ideologies. The orgasmic rush. Explosion, fragmentation, a private act made public. 
and the shiny new setting of a holiday resort or big shopping mall is built for this. As though the real enemy is pleasure. Stop. Shopping, fucking, eating, all become subsumed into one big amorphous leisure time, which has already been commandeered via mobile phone and Blackberry and email into work time. All this acceleration just makes for more and more postponement, a clearer, sharper, more enjoyable postponement. No way out. You're in the loop. Growing up in a highly coded and censored society, which Britain was in the 1950s, I became fascinated by grown-up silences. I don't mean not talking. I always found grown-ups far more talkative than I was. They had a whole vocabulary of reference. Drink, racing, motor cars, and Mrs. Barnett's stroke. I mean what wasn't talked about in front of the children other conversations which were almost palpable. I was no older than the boy is now when I began to realize there were exclusion zones and secret adult behavior which was tolerated but not referred to and that families were extremely complex their main function being to turn life into huge storage containers for resentment. I have to say I've always enjoyed the old English establishment vices of prevarication and hypocrisy. I admired friends who lied for the sake of it, like they were knocking up at tennis. I did my best to accrue my own share of secrets, believed in assignation and assignment, believed in a world of hidden emotion that circulated like a secret currency, believed in two lives, an exterior one of conformity and an interior one subject to emotional riptides and inner voices that bordered on the incoherent. This reminds me of a detail from the Second World War, dispelling the illusion of the vast loneliness and silence of the wartime skies. In reality, the air war was a radio war, and German fighter pilots hunting enemy bomber fleets found their radio frequencies jammed by the British as they were subjected to a sonic bombardment in their headphones and were tempted by siren voices, the radio equivalent to the Rhine Maidens, whose task was to create total confusion using misinformation and blandishments to lure the pilot into taking the wrong course. That story came to mind when I did something quite out of character and contacted a woman from 25 years ago, still living in Berlin. 
partly out of curiosity, part selfishness, to see if I was still the same person I used to be, and partly for the shock of the connection, but mostly because everyone does it. With everything online and accessible at the push of a button, it becomes easier to than not to. And in the surprise of her answer, the years fall away. A singular dream of reciprocity. A singular dream of reciprocity in which electronic text doesn't take the place of the flesh but stands in for a while, dictated by the logic of dream where the flesh may be asleep but the mind indulges intensely indiscreet sexual thoughts somewhere between ESP and déjà vu like heroin chased with coke. A déjà vu in which you repeat things you wish you'd said, relive things you wish you'd experienced before, secret parts of you, not secret in some deep, dark Freudian model, but secret like playground secrets, as in just below the surface. Secret like it's all it's written all over your face. We knew each other. I went on. I would like to be able to talk freely. I want a life unconditioned by resentment, not always on the verge of aggression. I would like to fall in love before it's too late. I don't care who with. What are you doing? A big surprise. I value my depressions because they define me as something I'm familiar with. Yeah, all is well. She read my evasiveness as a sign of non-commitment. Given the unresolved nature of religious agnosticism, I had an antipathy towards any kind of commitment. Most of the time, I feel like attacking everything, but I don't know if this is frustration or the method I should be adopting. Berlin has changed. It used to be an island. You remember? Passive driving? Compulsive driving? Well, Secret you always did like to go down the wheel. Except to number. Second time of asking. Really, really, really. Let me know how you are. Not just what you're doing. Let's talk. You may start out with distance and order in your head, but before you know it, you're rushing, rushing to send, desperate to receive. You're in tatters, in shreds. You're, you can't believe this, trembling, oh yes, in your rush to answer. I often think about being dead and the daily drizzle of family life, 
fuck list zones, reduction of expectation, any role except the one you want. Where am I? The day-to-day -day becomes about forms of suspension, work, tiredness, household drudgery. And I'm thinking about my father now, on the cusp of turning into an old fool, with no sense of wisdom or progression, governed by naivete and susceptible to crushes. The desire to behave badly is just another fantasy because one uses relationships to hide behind, like a scared child. You never write anything about your personal situation. Are you with anyone? Are you content? Moving around so often as a child and without anywhere obvious to call home, I told myself that life was a matter of keeping ahead and the past was for jettisoning, with the present sacrificed in the equation. Always the daydreamer, I was, without realizing, running to catch up. The past is a different country, L.P. Hartley wrote in The Go-Between, his novel about childhood. Hartley had served in the Royal Norfolk Regiment in the First World War, the same regiment that my father joined at the start of the second. Hartley's story was narrated by an old man, only a few years older than I am now, which says something about age as my generation doesn't consider itself old yet. Untested like men of my father and Hartley's generations, we get older later, adolescence extended, adulthood deferred indefinitely. One of the things I've noticed about age is that with regard to the past, the time frame is no longer decisive. In fact, the past ceases to be measured in terms of time or distance and becomes more like a series of rooms. That the past becomes an ever-present space, like a room next door not one which one wants to enter necessarily, but in which you can find yourself at any time. We drive on. There's talk of meeting and not meeting. Perhaps we both suspect that a correspondence such as ours has a brief starburst before the status quo prevails. I neglect to mention America, or the boy, when I realize that there's nothing about email that says where you are. It doesn't matter whether they are there or not. Where is there, anyway? All those secret torture zones or rooms where the US have been rendering its non-people prisoners are not so different from all the servers in the world, those underground sites where your email is rooted, sustained. Lines and lines of shiny servers like prison corridors. Military hardware, metaphysical shareware. Everybody. Containers. Trap. 
traffic. Traffic. Childhood. History. Sex. Store. Storage. Surveillance. Inner space. Death. Death of content. Rendition. Play. Play. Play on words. Loss. List. Listless. Atom bomb. Shopping mall. Concentration camp. Digital. Celebrity. Big shed. Happiness. Driving. Driving. First, sex is like being in America. You think, why can't it always be like this? And then it becomes an afterthought that gets added to the list. It becomes more reserved and less adventurous. It becomes another of those things. It, or its lack, becomes about the difference between two people when previously it had been what dropped them together. Wanting. Driving through the American West, I read a book about the Nazi dreams of Eastern expansion, which they romanticized as a version of the American frontier, bringing the green of German culture to the Polish wilderness. As with all myths, there was a degree of pathos and self-pity, with the German soldier idealized as a Robinson Crusoe, cast away in the desolate plains, swamps and forests of the Eastern Front. But to speak of Indians in the context of the Wild East was to contemplate extermination. The Germans lost the war, so were unable to launder their genocide in the way the Americans had, and the British in Tasmania, and the Belgians in the Congo, and all those other colonial expansionists who removed weaker and less well-equipped races standing in their way. I was 10 or 11 when I first learned about the Nazi exterminations, quite by chance, from a book with photographs belonging to parents of a school friend. Afterwards I could find no one who would talk about it, and this at a time when all schoolboys were informally fluent in the history of both world wars. Because I'd lived in Germany, I felt guilt by association. My childhood religion, whose history was full of belief being put to the test, was strangely quiet on the subject and had, at the time, done nothing. 
Perhaps those stark photographs of the massed dead and the church's silence were the start of a scepticism which led to my rejection of any belief in an afterlife. Both contributed to a dawning realization that death might be the only subject and everything else was frivolity and denial. In The Drowned and the Saved, Primo Levi, a survivor of Auschwitz, wrote that we're all so dazzled by power and prestige that we forget our essential fragility. That we're all in the ghetto and outside reign the lords of death and the train is waiting and there is not a diary or story in this history in which this train does not appear. My German actor points out that he and I were the first generation of men born in the last century who didn't have to fight. He emails in response to my question, I'm not sure what the present state of guilt is in Germany. We had the DDR, guilty, not guilty. So whoever is from the East doesn't feel guilty. We had Bader Meinhof. Whoever was leftist, anti-Israel, anti-US doesn't feel guilty. Then we had the Hitler movie with Bruno Ganz. And whoever saw that doesn't feel guilty now. Google German guilt. Everybody needs a place to fail. Everybody needs a place to fail. Fail. In the 50s, everyone was afraid they would die before they experienced anything. Now we know we are already sick of everything. So let's at least make our forgetfulness sublime. One-line phone texts like SOS messages in a bottleneck. Emails in which we feel closer to someone halfway around the world than we do to our own unknown, unacknowledged neighbors. But we are the disappeared. We disappeared ourselves. The other defining event of my generation's childhood took place half a world away from Poland, in Dallas, Texas, on the 22nd of November, 1963. President John F. Kennedy was the second most important Roman Catholic after the Pope and the first Roman Catholic president. I was educated by Benedictine monks and when it was announced just before the evening meal that he'd been shot, we were asked to remember him in our prayers as a paragon of virtue and a warrior for the free world. The following year, the first book came out questioning the official version. It was called Who Killed Kennedy, suggesting a Texas oil cartel had been responsible. 
I still have my copy somewhere, but I was never really that interested in who'd killed him. More in the permutations, like a gambler. Later, I grew to understand how the conspiracy theory becomes a perfect complement to the state of religious lapse, becomes the substitute for lost belief, based as it is on hidden configurations and coded meaning with the possibility of epiphany and revelation. But that never happens because of the prospect of another more sensational discovery, which is part of its appeal. I remain unsold by any theory and was even reconsidering the one about the lone gunman until I stood at the window of the sixth floor of the book depository and thought, a hell of a shot. From morning on I waited yesterday. They knew you wouldn't come, they guessed. You remember what a lovely day it was. A holiday. Unsealed, uncensored. No envelope. The email circulates in its own wide open night. Naked, nerveless, Yesterday. emphatic. The consummation of the old idea that the best place to hide something is in the open. And. Uh, And as we know, nothing goes unlocked today. Given that conspiracy is so often fiction, I offer my own entirely satisfactory version. Kennedy was the world's number two Catholic, He'd made an enemy of the Israelis by curtailing their nuclear program and sending in weapons inspectors. And since the Profumo affair in England, sexual scandal was a new threat to politics, and Israeli intelligence intended to destroy Kennedy by leaking details of his blatant sex life to French scandal sheets. But when the Vatican learned this, it feared the church would be rocked to its foundations with further damaging implications for the Cold War, with Kennedy as the free world's leading statesman. So it did the necessary, using its mafia contacts, and Jack became a martyr, reputation intact. But who is the agency who watches, listens, logs? Who or where is the agency who asks you all these questions? Who is the who who tells you you have email or asks, do you really want to send this? Unconscious made exterior, not as object, but spectral, half text, half voice. And far from fearing or resenting this, maybe we want and need it. I wonder whether future history lessons, if they have any, will show England as part of the American Empire, separate from the rest of Europe, with the exception of the special case of occupied West and East Germany. As a result of the war, England was in economic hock to the US for decades and such excessive borrowing 
make sense of the troubled and shrouded anxieties of English post-war culture. We bought their films, we bought their music, we aspired to their apparent classlessness, we aspired to their universality, we gave them air bases, we copied their ideas in just about everything. We even embraced their cereals for breakfast when the rest of Europe rejected them. And now it turns out that laboratory rats preferred to eat the packaging because they found there was more nutrition in the cardboard than in the content. We have moved away from potentially crippling debt, so that's positive, but we snipe more. I worry that our relationship is conditioned by intolerance and withholding. I was being manipulated while thinking, what do I know? She knows more about feelings than I do. Then thinking afterwards, fuck. And so they all, each in his own way, reflecting or unreflecting, go on with their daily lives. Everything seems to take its accustomed course, for indeed, even in these desperate situations, where everything hangs in the balance, one goes on living as though nothing were wrong. After a lifetime predicated on the negative, it's a relief to find that I believe in nothing. The boy teaches the value of the moment and the importance of seeing, which is perhaps all that matters. Thinking about my own itinerant, displaced childhood prompts the realization that life is probably more a matter of luck than determination. The triumph amounts to crisis avoided, and we are defined less by the existential tenets of our actions than by what is inherited and what is handed on. Again, matters of luck and approximation. borrow a metaphor from childhood sermons that life is not a 400 meter dash but a relay race and furthermore one of botched handovers and that we are in the end merely readers of the unexposed texts of our parents lives and in turn our children after us <laughs> 